Hey, welcome to Gold's Rudge and welcome back new subscribers. And uh, a little while ago, I made a video about this subject of uh, the title was, can you run a 427 uh, L88 on pump gas? And it got a lot of attention, a lot of likes, a lot of questions. And today I'm going to try and answer all those questions for you. And I got a few more uh, things to add at the end. But back to the likes, what happened in our, this last video, uh, in one video I doubled the amount, amount of subscribers that it took years to build up. And according to YouTube, it's because it got so many likes. So if you're not a subscriber, please subscribe. And if you are, if you hit like, they'll show it to somebody else that might watch it. So, so the question is, or the questions are, can you run a, an L88 427 on pump gas? Can you run it on 87 octane fuel? The next question is, even if you can, should you do that? Uh, and if you are going to do it, what are the risks and rewards? Uh, what are the costs and benefits? And then we're going to get into the issue of one reason why you can't, or maybe you can't, is because of uh, the dreaded word detonation. And if you don't dread it, you should start dreading it because it can destroy your engine and break your heart. It can do a lot of damage. And detonation isn't the only thing. There's also a pre-ignition and ignition knock. And there are, there are three different things. And I'm going to explain all three of them today so we understand it. So I also have something at the end, which uh, I'm adding on. I mentioned uh, in the last video that the OEMs, or that in 1971, uh, the, for many people anyway, the muscle car era uh, died a natural death. And the question is, did it really die a natural death or did the OEMs kill it off on purpose? And I'm going to get into that and give you something to think about at the end. So back to the 427 on, on pump gas. One of the points is, even if you can, should you? So, uh, and I'm going to get into what what it takes to be able to do that and how you manage it. And what happened was uh, I got overwhelmed by responses from the last video. Many, many subscribers wrote in to say that they run high compression engines, 12, 13 to 1, 200, 220 PSI cranking pressure on pump gas, and they do it successfully. And one of the issues is if you know what you're doing and you manage it, and you manage your timing, you make sure you don't lug or load the engine, uh, you run a rich fuel air mixture, uh, a whole bunch of other precautions that you take, you probably can. In fact, I had examples of uh, some subscribers who said they use the same engine for street and strip, and then during the week they use pump gas, and when they're racing it, they put in racing gas. And that's fine if that works for you. Um, so, Let's get into why you shouldn't run pump gas next, and I'm going to come back to this subject. And that's the dreaded word detonation. And there's really three bad things that can happen uh, if you don't have enough octane in your fuel and you're running too high compression. And the first one is, uh, before it even gets to that, that's pre-ignition. And pre-ignition happens when uh, the fuel-air mixture combusts in your cylinder before the spark plug fires. And the problem with that is, it's when pre-ignition happens, before the spark plug fires, it's trying to drive the piston back down in the opposite direction that it's trying to go. So the pressure rises very quickly. And so pre-ignition is not good. Uh, the next one is uh, ignition knock. Ignition knock is when you have combustion, but you don't have your fuel-air mixture properly atomized in the cylinder, and you have pockets of fuel-air mixture that are different, it creates a knock. And, and if you ever heard it, it sounds like uh, aluminum baseball bat hitting a hard ball, that kind of a sound. So uh, that's not good either. And the third one is detonation. And before I describe detonation, let's describe what the normal cycle should be. So the engine is called a combustion engine and it has ignition. So you have ignition and combustion. A lot of people say the fuel-air mixture explodes. Well, it shouldn't explode. And if it does, then you got detonation. That's what detonation is. It's a high pressure wave uh, that goes through your cylinder. And just to give you an idea, in a normal cycle, 
Uh, if you, we talk about 180 to 200 PSI of cranking pressure, the peak uh, cylinder pressure at right after about 20 degrees after top dead center is about 1,000 PSI in a normal situation where you have normal combustion. Detonation com pressures can be 300 PSI and, or sorry, 3,000 PSI, whereas the normal uh, combustion pressure is about 1,000 PSI. So if you take the math, 1,000 PSI, the, square, the area of a four inch piston is about 12 and a half square inches. That's 12 and a half thousand pounds pushing that piston down. That's six and a quarter tons, okay? So more than six tons anyway. When you have detonation, you have three times that. And what can detonation do? It can bend connecting rods, it can break pistons, it can smash out your bearings and break your crankshaft and break your heart while it's doing it. So you don't want to have that happen. So let's get back then, now that we know what you don't want to have happen, how you can manage it. And once again, a lot of the examples that I got from, from subscribers where, yeah, I run it, but I do all these following things to make sure that uh, I know that I'm doing it safely. And one of the things that uh, is common is backing off the timing. In fact, there's a video uh, on YouTube, of course, a professional video of some guys running over 13 to one compression ratio on pump gas. They set the timing at 22 degrees. Well, uh, one of the problems with doing that is you take the power back out of it again. And so, the question would be, if you didn't have such high compression pressures, uh, then you could use your full timing of 30 to 36 degrees or whatever it is, make just as much power and not have that risk. So uh, getting back to the point is, even though you can, should you? And the risks and rewards, the rewards are, uh, a lot of people that wrote in said, you know, I need every last horsepower. And we know that, we understand that. We, I, I work for Trevor Culver Motorsports in the summertime, and we race the circle track uh, on, the, on the APC Auto Parts Centers traveling series all over Ontario, and we also race at the, on the Delaware uh, regular weekly series. And we would do almost anything for a few more horsepower because a few more horsepower is a few inches a lap. After 50 laps, that's the car length, and the car length is enough to win a race. So uh, well worth the time for us. And, if, and the problem that we have with it, of course, is that uh, we have a sealed crate engine that we can't do much with except uh, tune it and maintain it. So, so, but if you're at that edge, if you're a drag racer or whatever kind of racer that you are, and you're tempted to run high compression because you need the last bit of horsepower, then you have to do that. And you, if we could do it, we would. We just can't do it. But the other thing you have to recognize as you crank up the compression and the, and the pressure, uh, I mentioned that I like, usually if I'm building an engine for someone, 160 to 180 PSI. Some people are 180 to 200 and more. There's a thing called diminishing returns. So uh, as you get up higher and higher in compression ratios, you get less and less for it. In other words, you gain a lot more from going from nine to one to 10 to one compression ratio than you get when you go from 11 to 12 to one compression ratio. So you're not getting back as much as, uh, as, as you would think. It's not proportional. The curve bends over and the payback is a lot less. So, so the incentive uh, for me is not there. And, and the other point I have to make for myself is once the engine leaves the dyno, I have no control over what's going to happen to it next. And uh, people that manage their own engine and set the timing back, run rich fuel air mixtures, uh, keep the engine cool is a good point, and manage how you drive it. All those things uh, can do that. But once I turn an engine over to a customer, uh, I don't have any control of that, and uh, I worry about every single one of them out there. So I'm like the soup Nazi. I suffer from my engines. So I don't want to have my engines out there exposing to these things, and then th things happen, and we never know really who's, whose fault it was. So that's one of the issues that I have to be concerned with, 
and I'm sticking to my 160 to 180. Not to say, going back to the original question, can you run an L88 427 up pump gas? I really think you could if you're careful and do all the things that I mentioned. Uh, 87, don't even think about it. Why would you think about it? If you can get pump gas uh, that's 93 or 94 octane, then you should use the best octane you could if you're going to do uh, something like that. So that's kind of how I think about the issue. Um, and so uh, you're on your own if you decide to do that. I'm not making any recommendations about it. And uh, uh, the things that you have to remember, uh, one of the, just before I get to that, maybe the classic example of uh, detonation. Uh, you're going up a hill, you're in high gear, you're at low RPM, and you open the throttle wide open, and that's when you hear the pinging sound. Typically, especially if it's a standard transmission vehicle where it can't downshift, and because detonation is a lot bigger problem at low RPM than it is at high RPM and more likely to happen. The old term they used to say, you should never lug an engine, and you should never lug an engine. And lugging an engine means loss of throttle, low RPM. Shift it down, get your RPM up to higher speed. And the reason for that is, there's a couple of reasons for that. When uh, the, R the engine RPM is faster, there's less time for that shock wave to travel. The, vent the only way that shock wave gets vented is when the exhaust valve opens. There's less time for that shock wave to travel if you had an, a high RPM. We have noticed detonation from time to time on the dyno. Detonation is never a good thing, but it's a lot bigger problem at low RPM, wide open throttle, no vacuum, and, uh, and uh, very high at low speed, you have a very high volumetric efficiency. The cylinder's filling. Add to that, the temperature's hot as well, and uh, that engine is very susceptible to detonation under those circumstances. So that's another thing to think about if you're going to try and do that. And so I'll leave that part with you. Um, I probably created some more questions and answers, and I'm going to get comments. But I'm going to move on to my last point. I mentioned in the, in the previous video that uh, Starting in 1971, the EPA mandated that all cars had to run on, on unleaded fuel. And for many, that was the end of the muscle car era. And so the question, did it die a natural death or did it get killed off by the OEMs? OEMs? So think about it. Starting in 1968, the end of the 60s was the beginning of environmental awareness, at least in, in society. Maybe people are aware of it, but in society it wasn't very much. And all of a sudden, uh, mankind became aware that, you know, we, got, we can destroy this environment if we don't do the right thing. So some of the things that, that happened that affected the OEMs, uh, first of all, in, in starting in 68, they started putting uh, air pumps on engines, on all engines. My Z28 had an air pump when it was new. And so did all the other ones starting in 68. So what an air pump did was took fresh air and pumped it into with little pipes into the exhaust manifolds so that it would dilute the gases that were coming out of the engine that would never pass an environmental test. So by the time they got to the tailpipe and they were diluted with fresh air, they would pass. And the motto back then was the solution to pollution is dilution. So think about it. That's kind of how that, that worked. The other thing, uh, they re recognized that the EPA standards were going to get tougher and tougher. And so that was one of the reasons that, that OEMs, uh, you know, probably wanted it to end. They already were lying about the horsepower of their engines. Everybody knows that an L88 made 500 horsepower, not 425. The Hemi as well probably made well over 500 horsepower. And lots of other engines made a lot more power. Uh, then they were advertised. The insurance companies were on their back. Uh, warranties were a big problem. People were buying hot rods uh, like L88s from a dealership, taking them out drag racing, blowing them back up, blowing them up, bringing them back in and getting warranty. Warranty costs were extraordinary. Marketing costs were extraordinary. Uh, so it was easier for them to sell a whole bunch of Vegas and Pintos uh, than to keep fighting each other over the muscle car market. And 
I could be wrong, but that's one of the theories that I have that maybe the OEMs thought, you know what, this is just not worth the trouble. It's going in the wrong direction. We're going to be facing stricter and stricter EPA regulations. And therefore, why don't we just back off on this thing and, and use the EPA, use the 1971 mandate for unleaded fuel for an excuse to back out of the muscle car industry. I'll leave that one with you. Okay, before we wrap up, take one, look, one last look at this gorgeous garage art. Uh, this engine is going in the El Camino next week. So that's going to be a project, and we will try to make some videos about that. If you've never put a big block where a small block used to be, uh, then you should watch my channel because I'll, I'll have some stuff about if actually make a list of all the things that you have to do to change, be, pre be prepared to change things you might not have thought of, like we have to change, change the brake booster, for example, because the valve cover won't fit under the st stock brake booster. There's a whole bunch of other stuff. So I'm going to talk about that next week. Uh, this, this is the 400. I said I got two 400s. That one's actually a 406. I actually sold this engine and it's going to be going together fairly soon. Uh, gentleman named Pete DeMello purchased it and he's putting it in an S10. So it should make that S10 spin the tires pretty good. And I'll describe this, what I actually ended up doing to this engine when I get it more complete. Uh, but it's going to have about 10 to 1 compression ratio and it's going to have about 175 PSI of cranky pressure, which is kind of in the range of my standard. And this is my other, was 400 block, this is actually a 406 block, it's board 30 over. This one has got, um, I've talked about it before, this one has got the ARP bolts and it's got aftermarket uh, uh, caps and a whole bunch of other good stuff on it. Flat top pistons, I do not have heads for it because with flat top pistons I need a 72cc combustion chamber and therefore... Uh, I uh, cannot use the flat, I, I need to get my compression in line, but even with that, uh, I am looking and I haven't decided yet, I don't have a camshaft, it's going to be a roller, uh, and it's going to be a pretty big camshaft, and I am looking at going up to 11 to 1 compression ratio, but with the roller, with the late intake valve closing, you're at around 70 degrees, I'm still just over 180 PSI, I think 182 PSI. So I'm kind of pushed in a limit on my own, uh, my own policy, but I'm not far off of it. So, however, we'll update you. Haven't uh, made all those decisions yet. Kind of got two going on at the same time, but next week we're going to be busy installing. So once again, if you haven't subscribed, please do that. Uh, give me a like if you're still watching and uh, YouTube will show it to somebody else and maybe I'll have some new subscribers. We're pretty encouraged and we're going to keep going. I like sharing my experience and knowledge, but subscribers make it make a lot more sense. Thank you for watching Gold Scratch.